becomes acquainted with different uh, antigens. And recall that what we were talking about was the following, that there were several kinds of phagocytic cells. Phagocytic cells are cells that chew up other things, both macrophages and even more frequently um, dendritic cells, many of which hang around lymph nodes, by the way. They process antigens into um, oligopeptides. The oligopeptides get presented on the surface of these cells. Let's say here's a macrophage uh, in, in the form of, um, through the class II uh, MHC molecules, which are displayed on the surfaces of these cells. And here's a typical oligopeptide that has been chewed up from one of the antigens that was previously internalized, chewed up, uh, inter eaten up by the um, macrophage dendritic cell and then presented on the surface. Recall then we have a, an itinerant macrophage or dendritic cell. Could we turn on the uh, sound just a little, just a notch? Thank you. Uh, and this uh, dendritic cell or macrophage, I'll just call it a macrophage, for the moment, is then um, moving through the, um, it, largely through the lymph nodes, but wherever it moves, it's carrying along this oligopeptide. And recall that we likened this um, <clears throat> voyage of it to a Middle Eastern market where there's a lot of bazaar stalls on either side of the, the road, and where instead of the usual male merchants, there's a lot of female merchants hanging out. And these females are called T helper cells. They're a kind of T lymphocyte or T cell. T helper cell, refer, T sub H, refers to their function. And here are all of these T helper cells. I'll indicate each of them here as a pink circle. And these T helper cells display on their surface to blow them up to a large, large size a T cell receptor that has, that is organized much the way an immunoglobulin molecule, an antibody molecule is organized. That is to say, it has variable and constant regions. It's able, uh, it's generated through the rearrangement of antibody-like genes, but it only functions, this T cell receptor, or as it's called in the trade, the TCR, only functions to sense the presence of antigens in the extracellular space. In fact, it senses, it senses antigens in the context of the MHC class II. So here, here's an MHC class II molecule. We can think of the MHC class II as being a hand, which is presenting this oligopeptide. Uh, I haven't drawn it as a hand, but you can pretend it's a hand. And this MHC class II is being presented by either a macrophage or a dendritic cell. And recall we talked about the voyage of this macrophage or dendritic cell through this, this street here, and all these T helper cells are kind of lazily waiting along on the sidelines, looking at what this, this uh, phagocytic cell is hawking. Most of the uh, T helper cells are totally uninterested in what he's hawking, but one of them is struck, it's love at first sight, this one over here, let's say, because her T cell receptor is precisely, uh, precisely recognizes this oligopeptide in the context of the MHC class II molecule. And I, obviously I would like to draw thousands of these T helper cells here, I'm, uh, each of which bears a different T cell receptor on her surface. I'm only showing one. And uh, recall that after uh, they make this encounter, the uh, macrophage, uh, the uh, T helper cell gets all excited because she says, oh, I can't believe it, you have exactly the oligopeptide that's recognized by my receptor. And so she gets all excited, and what she does is she proliferates, because that's about all that excited cells can do. Uh, well, they can do other things, but again, we don't want to talk about it. Anyhow, so, so the, uh, the T helper cell, this T, particular T helper cell undergoes a clonal expansion and is now activated, i.e. activated not only psychologically, but physiologically by having encountered the antigen-presenting cell this, the, uh, the MHC class II, the macrophage is called an antigen-presenting cell. 
it's presenting using its MHC class two molecules to do so. Uh, macrophages and dendritic cells are pretty much uh, similar in this respect. Macrophages go all over the body and the tissues. Dendritic cells tend to inhabit the lymph nodes. But from the point of view of our discussion today, we can imagine that they're functionally uh, quasi, essentially equivalent. And having said that, uh, now these T helper cells go looking for a congenial B cell. So we have now... We st so now we have a third actor in the drama, and the congenial B cell looks like this. And the B cell has the following thing. The B cell has also, on its surface, MHC class II molecules, which can be used in antigen presentation. But the B cell has, in addition, as we said last time already, on its surface, uh, IgM molecules. And IgM is a brand of antibody. Keep in mind that really one of the, the paradoxes that we did, haven't really fully uh, uh, settled on is, is the following um, question or the following issue. How is it that when a, T, when a B cell um, sees an, a cognate antigen, why does it get stimulated? In other words, what is it that uh, induces this, the B cell to start proliferating? Here's another version of what I showed you last time. Where a B cell which makes the right antibody gets stimulated, but a B cell that doesn't does not get stimulated. And that's the issue we're wrestling with right now. So here on the surface of, of this B cell is an IgM molecule. Keep in mind that an IgM molecule is, is a, an antibody molecule. Immunoglobulin means Ig. It's the earliest form of antibody that's made. Once again, it is antigen specific. It's also, its variable region has been rearranged through the fusion of different VDJ segments and hy somatic hypermutation. And this B cell has a very interesting property. This is a naive cell, and what this B cell does is, is as follows. It moves around the body, and if this B cell happens to find an antigen which is recognized by its antibody, the IgM antibody, then the B cell will bind this antigen using it's, it's uh, <coughs> uh, IgM molecule to do so. More importantly, it will then internalize this antigen and chew it up into little pieces and then present it on, the surf on its surface via the MHC class II molecule. So let's just review what we've been saying. Before, we were talking about macrophages and dendritic cells which gobbled up whatever they could Processed, this, processed whatever they gobbled up and put it on the surface again as MHC class II. And therefore, the, <clears throat> the, the macrophages and the dendritic cells are really like sewer rats. They'll just chew on anything and they'll put it on their surface. They're totally promiscuous in, in what they present on their surface. But here, the B cell is doing something rather similar, but the B cell isn't presenting whatever it happens to stumble across on its surface the B cell is extraordinarily selective at what it presents on its surface. It only presents on its surface those antigens which are recognized by its T cell, uh, by its uh, IgM molecule. So here it uses its IgM molecule to grab hold of this antigen. It internalizes the antigen and then presents it back on the surface as in MHC class II molecule. So there's a, there's a profound contrast in the behavior of these two kinds of antigen presenting cells. The macrophages and dendritic cells, they just gobble up everything and put whatever they find they put on their surface. They don't care with MHC class II. The B cell is extraordinarily selective and specific. It will, it will pull in, not through regular phagocytosis, it will pull in using its IgM receptor specific antigens that are recognized by its IgM molecule and then externalize it using its MHC class II molecule to do so. Let's go back to the drama of the activated T helper cell. And here's the activated T helper cell. Uh, we'll draw her in pink. The T helper cell has just had an encounter with a macrophage or dendritic cell. And she's just left this marketplace, and now she's very excited. So here is her T cell receptor, T cell receptor. 
And she's very excited. She's putting out all kinds of growth factors and multiplying all over the place. And she starts looking again now for a B cell with which she can react. Now, most of the B cells in the body will not have an epitope that she recognizes. Most of the B cells in the body will have picked up other kinds of, of, of uh, things that happen to be recognized by their T cell receptor and will present it on the surface. A rare B cell will happen to internalize an antigen and put on its surface, which is the same antigen that was recognized previously in the previous encounter. And so now this T helper cell goes around looking for a, an attractive male. What's an attractive male for her? An attractive male for her is one whose MHC class II molecule is recognized directly in the context, and, the, and this oligopeptide is recognized by her T cell receptor. And so she'll come over here, and she'll say, exci <coughs> she'll say excitedly to the, the B cell, you can't believe what just happened. She will say, I was just there. I just went through the market. Uh, I, I was sitting there in the marketplace, and along came a macrophage and presented me with an oligopeptide that exactly fit in my T cell receptor. And now, she says excitedly, here I find a B cell has exactly the same oligopeptide presenting it to me. Isn't that a coincidence? And the B cell says, come on, lady, get to the point. And she says, I just had an encounter with a, a macrophage, an dendritic cell. I recognized the same oligopeptide in the macrophage dendritic cell that you have. And the, the, the B cell says, well, I guess this must be some kind of meaningful encounter. And so these two cells get together. And what happens now is that the T cell, having uh, <coughs> recognized the oligopeptide presented on the surface of the B cell, now begins to send out signals to stimulate the B cell to proliferate. And this B cell now begins to proliferate as is indicated on this overhead. And eventually, it starts making IgM molecules. It makes more of them. And then through the class switching that we talked about last time, it'll make eventually IgG, secreted antibody, gam gamma globulin molecules. So you see here the, the, the three essential distinct uh, cell types that participate in this. And why is it so complicated? Because it's extraordinarily important that the immune system doesn't inadvertently make antibodies that are inappropriate for it to express. Because as we said before, if it, certain of those antibodies, indeed possibly many of them, could be auto-reactive. And what do I mean by auto-reactive? I mean reactive with self. They could be, they could be uh, antibodies that react with one's own ant tissues. And in so doing, uh, they could create serious kinds of autoimmune diseases. So we have the sequence of, uh, of fail-safe reactions. So in, finally, the decision for the B cell to get activated depends on a previous encounter with the same oligopeptide by a, macro, by a macrophage or dendritic cell, the T cell, the helper cell acting as an intermediary, and now activating the B cell. Once the T cell tells the B cell that the T cell has had a previous encounter with exactly the same oligopeptide, on that occasion being presented by a macrophage or dendritic cell. And that is actually the mechanism by which we get this clonal expansion of B cells in the immune system, and ultimately uh, how, we get, um, how we get the production of antibody molecules. I mean, it's, this is the, the, the image I showed you earlier, but I never really explained to you what the biology behind that is. I just said that antigen encounter on the part of a B cell causes that B cell to enjoy clonal expansion. And now we've gone into the detail of describing how three different cell types interact, collaborate with one another to create um, the antibody response, because this B cell then goes on to produce IgM, as it already is doing, and then eventually IgG, and possibly a series of other immunoglobulins, IgE and IgA, which have other purposes. Now, all of this actually is an important prelude to our main topic of discussion for today, which is uh, the disease of AIDS. And uh, let me just add one other detail to this, because the ability of a T helper cell to recognize MHC class II molecules depends on another cell surface molecule on this, expressed by the T helper cell. And this other T cell surface molecule is called CD4. CD4 
we don't have to worry what it stands for. CD4 is not an antigen-specific receptor. CD4 instead only recognizes MHC class II molecules, no matter what they're carrying. So there are MHC class molecules, class II molecules, which I've implied to you, can carry thousands of different oligopeptides. CD4 doesn't carry, care what's being carried by the MHC class II. It just binds to MHC class II molecules, thereby telling the T helper cell that an encounter has been made with an antigen-presenting cell. So, so CD4 is simply, the ligand for CD4 is an MHC, is part of the MHC class II molecule. Now, that all leads us in a very nice segue to the whole disease of AIDS. Let's just remember how the disease of AIDS was discovered. In 1981, there were a group of five uh, young men who were all subsequently determined to be uh, gay, to be homosexual, who were discovered in San Francisco to have a very unusual kind of immunodeficiency. They all had night sweats. They uh, got different kinds of otherwise unusual diseases. For example, one of, the, one of the things they got was a disease called Kaposi sarcoma, which was otherwise known only in old uh, southern Italian and Jewish men, Kaposi sarcoma. They got, uh, but these were young men, and they were neither southern Italian nor Jewish. Uh, they got um, pneumocystis carinii, 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 which is a... Uh, <coughs> a uh, microbial infection of the lung, and in fact, and they got all kinds of different herp herpes virus infections. And they were all seen in a cluster by an alert physician who saw something very unusual and therefore said, uh, perhaps uh, said correctly, that they had acquired immunodeficiency. Now this acquired immunodeficiency is and a syndrome, by the way, a syndrome is for your information, is a whole collection of symptoms that appears together. That's what a syndrome means. So uh, AIDS, this term AIDS, came from the fact that they had a whole series of symptoms and this was an acquired immunodeficiency rather than a congenital immunodeficiency. Because given the complexity of the immune system, you can imagine correctly that there are a lot of people in the world who are born with, with defective, congenitally defective immune uh, systems. They're immunodeficient from birth because there's so many different proteins involved in regulating all of these different immune responses. But this was clearly different. Uh, it, it was an acquired immunodeficiency. It was seen in a very special subgroup. And so the race was on over the next two years to figure out what was going on. Now, by coincidence, starting in 1970-71, retrovirus research had begun. And as it turned out, retrovirus research in uh, President Nixon's war on cancer, retrovirus research was motivated largely by the notion that human cancers are caused by retrovirus infections. And that, and that led to the war on cancer. And the notion behind the war on cancer was totally wrong because it turns out that only a minute fraction of human cancers have anything to do with retrovirus infections. Although, as we've said earlier, retroviruses prove to be very important tools experimentally for discovering proto-oncogenes and oncogenes in the genome. But if you ask what fraction, of human being, being, what fraction of human cancers are actually due to a human being infected by a retrovirus, it's almost zero. It's a fraction of a, a small fraction of a percent. Nonetheless, in the 1970s, there was an enormous effort made in trying to figure out all of the biology of retroviruses. And by the late 1970s, people concluded this was very interesting science. Indeed, proto-oncogenes and oncogenes were discovered, but that it was pretty irrelevant to understanding directly how human cancer arose, which, could be, which human, human cancers could be explained rather by somatic mutations in the genome. In 1981, the uh, HIV, uh, or the AIDS infection arose. Um, and uh, what happened subsequently uh, was that there was a race on to try to find out what the infectious agent was, because it seemed to be an infectious agent. It was being spread from one gay young man to another um, that was used to induce this. And within two years, by 1983, 
the culprit retrovirus had been found. I'm telling you this long song and dance to, to, to give you the following insight. If there had not been a decade early of earlier retrovirus research, it could have taken the scientific community many, many years to figure out what was causing AIDS. But through a happenstance, through a sheer stroke of luck, by the time uh, the first <clears throat> individuals suffering from AIDS were encountered in 81, there was already a backlog of a decade's worth of detailed retrovirus research, which made it possible to discover, to discern almost within months, what was causing it. And the, the, the agent that was causing it was a retrovirus. Uh, the retrovirus here is indicated very uh, schematically. These artist drawings never have any uh, resemblance to what things really look like, and if they do, it's only by coincidence. Uh, let me borrow your laser pointer here for a second. So here, and, and this is what a retrovirus looks like, just to give you a, a feeling. In the, in the center, there are two single-stranded RNA molecules. Um, the virus is diploid. There's two copies of the genome for reasons we still don't understand. Surrounding it is a so-called nucleocapsid, which is responsible for protecting the RNA uh, molecules. These two pink dots are um, reverse transcriptase molecules because, as you'll recall, when retroviruses infect a cell, they carry the enzyme with them into the cell. You could say, why don't they make it after they get into the cell? And it's not totally obvious why, but this is what they do. There's another shell of proteins out here, and then beyond that is a lipid bilayer. And this lipid bilayer is, as you may recall, um, stolen from the cell from which the virus is protruding. Because if you look at retrovirus-infected cells, here's the plasma membrane of a retrovirus-infected cell. Here you can see a nucleocapsid forming with the RNA molecules. And this shoves its way, protrudes its way through the plasma membrane, stealing a patch of plasma membrane from the infected cell. And at the same time, this part of the plasma membrane carries with it viral glycoproteins. And viral glycoproteins, they're obviously glycosylated, as are many extracellular proteins. And in this case, they're indicated with these yellow ovals. And these viral glycoproteins are used to attach to subsequently infected cells. So what happens is that when the, the retrovirus gets out of the cell, uh, I'll draw it again uh, schematically here, it has this glycoprotein coat on it, it um, with the plasma membrane, and it uses these glycoprotein spikes, I, I just won't put the yellow ovals on them, to attach to cell, uh, cells which, are, which need to be infected. So here's a target cell that needs to be infected. So the target cell, and how does this virus know how, how, how to attach to this cell and not to other cells? Because on the surface of the target cell are certain cellular proteins, which are used for normal cell physiology, which are there, and which the virus has opportunistically developed an affinity for. So here on the surface of uh, a target cell might be a, a, a normal cellular protein to which the viral glycoprotein can bind. Or if you want to put another, you want to get technical, this enables the virus particle to adsorb, to attach to. Notice the D here rather than the B, to adsorb to the surface of the target cell. Importantly, what's the cell surface protein of the target cell to which HIV virus adsorbs? It's our old friend CD4, i.e., the HIV particle likes to adsorb preferentially adsorbs to the surface of cells that express the CD4 molecule on their surface. Note, by the way, that just five minutes ago, we described a totally different function of CD4. CD4 over here was said to be, represent the means by which the T helper cell can recognize MHC molecules being displayed on the surface of either um, uh, these uh, antigen-presenting uh, dendritic cells or B cells. But here we see CD4 in a, a totally different uh, context. Here, the CD4 represents the docking site to which the viral glycoprotein can attach, enabling uh, the virus, which came to be called human, um, uh, <coughs> human immun immunodeficiency virus. In fact, the virus was discovered by two groups simultaneously. One of them called it HTLV3. The other called it lymphadenopathy virus. The first group was American, the second group was French, and uh, they allowed uh, Harold Varmus, one of the 
co-discoverers of the proto-oncogene to act as sort of the judge to see what it would be called because there was great political tension. Would it, would it get the, the, the American or the French name, depending on which of the two uh, warring um, scientists, and they were warring, uh, could claim discovery. So he had a Solomonic decision. Uh, he decided to name it human immunodeficiency virus. That was a compromise. And by the way, some people in a less than charitable mood say, well, of course he named it her uh, human immunodeficiency virus because those are almost his own initials. So, uh, but I think that's unfair. Those are, these were his initials. Here's human immunodeficiency virus. He named it for the perfectly good reason. Anyhow, that broke the uh, Franco-American diplomatic uh, tension. And now be one began to realize that HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, attacked T helper cells. It preferentially infected T helper cells by virtue of the ability of the virus particle to dock itself to the CD4 molecules presented on the surface of these cells. By the way, what happens afterwards, after the virus becomes adsorbed to the surface, of a infectable cell, such as a T helper cell. So here's the, here's the virus particle. Here's the surface of a helper cell, a T helper cell. What happens then is these two lipid bilayers fuse with one another, so that now they became one. And now the internal contents, the internal contents, the, the nucleocapsid, which contains the RNA and the reverse transcriptase, now has direct topological access into the cytoplasm of the cell. In fact, the glycoprotein, the yellow ovals there, of human immunodeficiency virus actually has two functions. First, it specifically recognizes the CD4 molecules to which it then anchors or adsorbs the virus particle. And secondly, it also has uh, fusing functions, i.e. it's capable of causing the um, the, the lipid bilayer of the virion, or the virus particle, to fuse with that of the plasma membrane of the infected target cell. And once it's in there, then the virus can uh, begin to do its replication. Now, the replication of, uh, of the HIV uh, virus was already pretty well understood by the time that HIV was discovered in 1982, uh, uh, 83 because of this, retro, this backlog of retrovirus research. And just to uh, review for you how retroviruses replicate, RNA is put into the cell, single-stranded RNA. It's called plus-strand RNA because it is of the same polarity, of the same strandedness as messenger RNA. If it were complementary to messenger RNA, then it would be called minus-strand RNA. This is uh, reverse transcribed by the reverse transcriptase, which is carried into the cell. RT stands for reverse transcriptase. And now one gets a double-stranded um, uh, <clears throat> DNA molecule, a copy of the, of the virus. And this DNA copy is sometimes called a provirus. And just to review, this provirus is then subsequently integrated into the chromosomal DNA of the cell. So here's the uh, provirus. Here's the chromosomal DNA. And then, the pro and then this uh, integrated provirus then serves as a template for making progeny plus-stranded RNA. And this progeny plus-stranded RNA, which is, by the way, forward transcribed by RNA polymerase II, which is the, does the bulk of the heavy lifting in terms of making RNA in the nucleus, this uh, plus-stranded RNA can have two functions, recall. One, it can serve as a uh, template on ribosomes for making viral proteins, such as the viral capsid proteins. And two, the plus-stranded RNA can in turn be encapsidated, i.e. it can become packaged. Encapsidate equals it can become packaged by the viral proteins to make progeny virus particles, which can then bud, as I've indicated here, from the surface of the infected cell. Among these viral, uh, and in fact, we can already imagine three classes of viral proteins that are required for replication. First is the reverse transcriptase, which is encoded by the viral RNA. Second are the capsid proteins, which carry the RNA. And third are the viral glycoproteins up here, which these glycoprotein spikes, which are transmembrane proteins that protrude from the virion and allow the virion to adsorb to the surface of infected cells. It turns out that this... Um, <clears throat> 
this virus has, has become an extremely difficult virus to deal with. For most viruses that we have uh, encountered over the last hundred years, it's, one has had great success in making vaccines against these viruses, including, as we discussed in great detail, uh, polio virus. In fact, for smallpox, another virus, the vaccine effort was so successful that about 20 years ago, um, the last case of smallpox was uh, finally occurred in Eritrea in Northeast Africa when some herdsmen had the last documented case. And since that time, there have been no documented cases of smallpox um, in, in the wild. And there's only two or three stocks of smallpox virus uh, surviving. One of them is in some uh, <clears throat> research center in Moscow, and the other is probably in the Communicable Disease Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And there's been great debate, by the way, should one get rid of those surviving stocks, um, or should one keep them around for research? Uh, by now, you guys aren't vaccinated against smallpox because nobody gets it anymore, and there's a certain risk of getting a smallpox vaccine. I am, so I'm not worried, but maybe you should be, uh, because starting about 20, 25 years ago, one stopped vaccinating people against smallpox because it just doesn't seem to be necessary. Why give them the risk of having some disease, which happens in one out of a million vaccinees, instead of just leaving them unvaccinated? Well, I digress. Back to HIV. The fact is we've had enormous lack of success in making a good kind of vaccine against HIV. And why is that? Well, one of the most critical things is that the HIV is attacking and replicating in the T helper cells. And the T helper cells, it turns out, are the linchpins of the immune response. Keep in mind here that the T helper cells that I've shown you in this diagram over here represent these critical cellular messengers between the dendritic cells and the macrophages on the one hand and the B cells on the other. You wipe them out and the ability to make new antibodies is totally compromised. It turns out that T helper cells can also make, help to make another class of cells which are called cytotoxic T cells. T cytotoxic T cells, another kind of T cell, cytotoxic. And these cytotoxic T cells have on their surfaces T cell receptors, which they can use to recognize infected cells and kill infected cells. So the cytotoxic T cells aren't involved in making antibody responses at all. The cytotoxic T cells are involved in recognizing cells that are expressing unusual or foreign antigens on their surface and killing those cells. That's the function of the cytotoxic T cells. Obviously, it's quite different from the helper T cells. But once again, the activation and, and of the uh, cytotoxic T cells and empowering them to, do, to make these attacks on, um, on abnormal cells depends on the helper T cells. Once again, the helper T cells represent the linchpins, the keystones of the immune response. But because of this tropism, and when I use the word tropism, I mean because of the desire of the virus to infect, to face toward and infect a certain subset of cells in the body, this tropism of HIV for uh, killing, uh, infecting and killing helper T cells, the production of antibodies is strongly compromised on the one hand, and the production of cytotoxic T cells is compromised on the other. There's another aspect of, of HIV uh, infection which is also very insidious, and that's the following. It turns out that the body can initially make a uh, response, an immune response, against an infecting HIV particle. And here's kind of what things look like. I, I hope this shows up here. Uh, who can lend me a laser pointer again? Excellent, thank you. Okay, so here's what happens. And here, there's two graphs here. Uh, on one hand are, are the uh, cytotoxic T cells. And, and, and their level is shown in the solid line here. So, and look at the course of infection. It's plotted here in weeks and years. If you see what happens in a, in a primary HIV infection, and here on the right is the, on this ordinate here, is the viral titer indicated in um, log, on a log scale. So this is a, this is a semi-log graph for the, uh, for the viral titer. And what you see over here is, that when you're initially infected, there's an enormous burst of viral um, 
uh, tighter. It goes up by four, four or five orders of magnitude, and then it falls down dramatically by two or three orders of magnitude. And it goes on and it is, remains depressed by two or three orders of magnitude below its initial height for a number of years. What's going on then? The immune system has started to come with, has come to grips with the presence of the HIV virus and begins successfully to try to eliminate it. How does the immune system eliminate HIV? By two mechanisms. First of all, the immune system makes neutralizing antibodies of the sort that float through the uh, serum and are able to uh, glom on to the virus particle, attach to the virus particle, and thereby prevent it from being infectious. And secondly, as I mentioned last time, the immune system also can recognize virus-infected cells and kill them. And by killing a virus-infected cell, the immune system prevents that cell from continuing to function as a factory for putting out new virus particles. So there's two ways by which virus particles are eliminated. But note here that the virus-infected cell, which is critically important among all the cell types in the body, are the T helper cells. So, the immune, so certain components of the immune system are killing the T helper cells that are involved in harboring and producing HIV virus. So there's an auto-destruction on the part of the immune system. Look at, look at the same time at the, uh, titer of C, at the number of CD4 cells. And they're indicated here on the left ordinate, in this case, uh, cells per microliter. CD4 cells originally start up here. They go down by a factor of uh, two or three for the first uh, weeks. And, and then over a period of years, there's this ongoing struggle between the HIV particle and the immune system as the number of CD4 cells and the CD4 cells, we've said before, the CD4 positive cells are these T helper cells. As the number of these cells per microliter of blood progressively declines further and further and further. And finally, the number of CD, uh, of CD4 positive cells, i.e. T helper cells, gets so low that the uh, body is totally overwhelmed and uh, the patient then uh, dies of an opportunistic infection. What do I mean by an opportunistic infection? Well, what I mean is that we are surrounded all the time by all kinds of microbes, which, given the chance, will kill us within a couple days. Keep in mind, I told you that there are, um, in your gut, there are as many bacterial cells as there are in the rest of your body. And some of these bacteria are really nasty. I remember my grandfather, he got kicked in the belly by a horse. And three days later, he was dead. Why? Because some of the bacteria got out of his gut got into his peritoneal fluid cavity, and whoosh, gone. This was the pre-antibiotic era, by the way. Never knew him very well, because he died in 1916. I'm just telling you that your gut is full of all kinds of nasty things. On your skin, not just on my skin, but on your skin, there are billions, millions of Staph aureus bacteria. They're just waiting to cause you problems. Don't look, it's OK. Don't look too closely. Um, it, they're just waiting to cause a nasty infection as well. Every day, we breathe in all kinds of awful microbes, fungi, and all these kinds of things, uh, including pneumocystis. And rarely do we get sick because of the extraordinary competence of the immune system to respond to such a diversity of infectious agents and hold them at bay. In the 20th century, the percentage of people who die of infectious diseases has plummeted, both because of the immune system and because we're eating healthier, up to a point, uh, and um, because of antibiotics and antifungals. But in the end, if the immune system is defective, all the antibiotics in the world and all the antifungal agents can't save a patient if their immune system, if their uh, CD4 cells get down very, very low. Because these antibiotics and antifungals always work as collaborators with the immune system. They get rid of the bulk of the infection, but the immune system has to wipe out the residue. And what you see here is a struggle going on for uh, a period of three, four, five, six years, where the viral titer is successfully held low. And then all of a sudden, as the immune system weakens, the viral titer goes up to high levels, wipes out the residual T helper cells, and death invariably ensues. Now, I've given you one reason why the immune system um, can't deal with this virus, because virtually all other viruses attack various tissues throughout our body, but they don't attack the immune system itself. Here we're having a virus which is attacking the defense of the body, that is to say the immune system. 
So, that's, so one reason is the continuing depletion of the T helper cells. They can regenerate themselves for a period of time, very impressively long period of time, four, five, six, seven years, but ultimately uh, they get worn out, they die. Another reason is this is antigenic variation. Now, if you look at the retrovirus particle, what you see is on the surface the glycoprotein. It's right here. And the glycoprotein is used by antibodies to recognize and bind to the virus particle and neutralize it. Same as with poliovirus. But let's imagine, as happens to be the case, that the virus is highly error-prone in replicating its genome. When I say error-prone, I mean that instead of the host cell polymerase, which makes ultimately one mistake out of a billion, the viral replication machinery makes mistakes all the time. It's quite, it's quite uh, <coughs> defective in, in the fidelity and the faithfulness with which it replicates nucleic acid. That means that after each cycle of replication, there are, in effect, mutant viruses that have been produced, mutant progeny viruses, and where the mutation rate, instead of being 1 in 10 to the minus 9, might be 1 in 10 to the minus 2 or 1 in 10 to the minus 3. And that means that there are continually novel variants of HIV being produced in a person's body. Let's imagine that that person has developed antibodies against the viral glycoprotein of the virus that initially infected him or her. Let's imagine that. And those antibodies are successful in eliminating most of the virus particles of the sort that initially infected that individual. But if we can, now we can imagine the possibility that within a period of weeks or months, a new strain of HIV will arise within that individual's body, a mutant strain, in which the sequences that code the viral glycoprotein glycoprotein have been changed slightly. And now, the viral glycoprotein has changed slightly its epitopes. And the initially developed neutralizing antibody that recognized the initial cohort of virus coming into the cell, into the individual, no longer works. Because the virus has undertaken a strategy of immune evasion, immune, or it's sometimes called immunoevasion, in which now the viral glycoprotein, although it's still competent to uh, effect a, a replication cycle, to adsorb and fuse to the surface of an infected cell, many of the epitopes, many of the oligopeptide antigens on the surface of the glycoprotein have been changed slightly through amino acid substitutions, through point mutations. And hence, the initially developed antibody, which previously was successful in glomming on and, and, and neutralizing this virus particle, is rendered uh, ineffective. And now this second wave, this new strain of HIV, will grow up and, and expand in that individual um, and once again provoke a new immune response. And the same cycle will repeat it. The second strain will now soon be eliminated. But while the elimination is going on, there's strong Darwinian selective pressure favoring the outgrowth of yet another mutant strain, which is not recognized by either of the two initial antibody responses. And so over this period of many years, what's happening is that the virus and the immune system are playing continual cat and mouse games with one another. Virus, uh, the immune system goes after the virus, the virus moves over here, the immune system goes over, um, the immune system goes after that. And so you have a, a succession of antigenic variants. Here's one variant, here's another variant, here's another variant, and so forth. By the time the immune system succeeds in getting rid of the first variant, a new variant has appeared. And then the immune system ramps up its defenses and tries to get rid of that. And it succeeds almost, but by the time that has happened, yet a third variant has appeared. And so there are these continual clonal successions. A clonal succession represents a time where one clone of viruses ex explodes, expands. It's soon eliminated, collapses, and then another clone comes up and expands. And this goes on. This works OK for about four, five, six years. But ultimately, the ability of the T helper cells to replenish themselves and to continue to mount an effective immune response fails. There's yet another aspect of HIV infection which is so insidious, and that's the following. Let's look at the viral life cycle right here and the provirus. Remember, the provirus is this thing right here, which is integrated into the chromosomal DNA. 
And we can assume that this provirus is transcribed by RNA polymerase II, and I will tell you that the promoter of the provirus is carried in by the proviral DNA and actually depends on transcription factors that are present in the T helper cell. In fact, you'll recall that the T helper cell gets excited sometimes and other times it's not excited. And she gets excited, if I can attach gender to a T helper cell, when she encounters macrophages and dendritic cells and or when she encounters B cells. Other times, the T helper cell is kind of quiet and unactivated. But and what happens when a T helper cell gets activated through these encounters, the T helper cell starts making her own transcription factors, which are used in order to facilitate these complex biological interactions with both um, antigen-presenting cells, uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, and later on, B cells. And those same transcription factors that the, B cell, uh, that the T helper cell uses to turn on its own expression program are used by the provirus to transcribe its own DNA, i.e., HIV has evolved a proviral promoter sequence here which takes advantage of transcription factors that are present uniquely in an activated T cell. And when those transcription factors are available, not only does the T cell become activated, but the provirus becomes transcribed because these transcription factors now enable RNA polymerase II of the host to transcribe the provirus. But let's imagine now, if we follow that scenario to its conclusion, what happens when the T cell is not activated? When the T cell is quiescent, when it's quiet, these transcription factors are not available to attach to the promoter of the integrated provirus, and as a consequence, the provirus will not be transcribed. It won't make RNA. And in that situation, how will anybody know that there's an integrated provirus in there? Well, the provirus is not being transcribed. The transcripts aren't being used to make viral protein. So in effect, the only evidence for the existence of HIV in this cell is this segment of DNA. In other words, this provirus can hide out in an unactivated quiescent T cell indefinitely. And the immune system can't know that there's a provirus hiding out in this T helper cell because it's not being transcribed. And therefore, one can have a quiescent um, T helper cell and several other cell types in the body, macrophages also, which aren't transcribing their proviruses. Well, you say, so what? Doesn't make any difference. If it's not being transcribed, it's not going to hurt the individual. But keep in mind that the idea of getting rid of a viral infection is to eliminate all traces of a viral genome from an infected individual. And that's what happens with smallpox and with poliovirus and with measles and with virtually all the other infections we have. But here we have a situation where the viral genome can hide out in a latent or inapparent configuration. There's no way to know it's there. And it may reemerge days, weeks, months, even years later because this previously transcriptionally silent provirus may suddenly be present in a cell uh, may be present in a cell which suddenly becomes activated. And now, an individual who thought, quote unquote, that he or she had gotten rid of HIV infection, all of a sudden realizes that there are viral genomes still hiding out in the body. And what that means is that in effect, it's absolutely impossible to rid the body of HIV infection ever. Once an individual is infected, in fact, that individual is infected for life. There's no way on earth that we have at present of getting rid of the viral infection because the viral genome is always hiding out here or there in different interstices of the immune system, hiding out in transcriptionally silent um, state. Of course, we have very effective drugs against HIV now. Some drugs inhibit the reverse transcriptase. Others inhibit the processing of the capsid proteins, that is, the proteins which uh, which are these capsid proteins happen to be cleaved from a large high molecular weight protein precursor into individual proteins, and, and there's an inhibitor of the protease that cleaves these proteins to the mature size. And those drugs together hold the viral infection at bay 10, for maybe 10, 15, 20 years. But keep in mind that even though the viral infection is being stopped by these drugs, first of all, the a virus is always hiding out in the bodies of such individuals in this latent, hidden form. 
And secondly, there may be a slow depletion of their T helper cells in spite of the effectiveness of these drugs. On that cheerful note, I wish you a good day.